Hi and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. Science Fiction Saturday again, so I'm doing two science fiction movies from the 1950s. One I like better than the other, but the one I don't particularly like has some interesting things that intrigue me. The two movies are, and I'll give them to you right up front, The Brain from Planet Aris, and I love that distortion of John Agar's face on this particular one, and Invaders from Mars. I've also got another copy of uh, Brain from Planet Aris, which is an old Hollywood one that was released here in Australia about 20 years ago. We've got to donate that one to a thrift store at some stage. Let's start with The Brain from Planet Aris from 1957 in beautiful black and white, low budget movie, which didn't have a lot of assets going for it at the time it was made. It was directed by Nathan Hertz. It's actually Nathan Duran, the guy who directed 20 Million Miles to Earth and a few other Ray Harryhausen related movies into the 1960s. Even though Duran directed it, he didn't like it, so he used his middle name as his last name in the credit on the movie. Now I can understand why there's a, there's a pan from one character to another near the start of the film where you can see the shadow of the boom mic. I always like seeing that kind of stuff in movies because it takes me totally out of the movie. Come to think of it, both of these movies have aliens who bury themselves underground. In this one, you've got John Agar, the ex-husband of Shirley Temple, playing a guy called Steve Marsh. I like the generic names they give people in these movies. He's a scientist working out in the desert because, of course, he is. Even though the desert we see in the location shots in this movie is basically Bronson Canyon with Bronson Cave because... Because it's a 1950s size fiction movie filmed in Los Angeles, so why wouldn't you? He's got a girlfriend called Sally, played by Joyce Meadows, to whom he's engaged. And he and his co-worker Dan Murphy, played by Robert Fuller. And if you're Australian, Dan Murphy is a funny name because our biggest liquor outlet is called Dan Murphy's. And every time I heard the name Dan Murphy, I got thirsty. <laughs> so Steve and Dan go out in the desert when they start detecting intermittent bursts of high radiation from somewhere in a place called Mystery Mountain, because, of course, it's called Mystery Mountain. So leaving Sally behind, they go out to the mountain and find an enormous cave that's just been buried there, and, of course, it's Bronson Canyon Cave, the famous one which three years earlier was the home of Roman in Robot Monster. They go exploring the cave, and John Agar's wearing a pith helmet for some reason. And that strikes me as funny, because I always associate pith helmets with jungle movies, not desert movies. But he's wearing a pith helmet in there, and... I'll get this out of the way as early as I can. John Agar was a shit actor. He was not a good actor at all, which is one of the reasons why his career never really went anywhere. He was so bad an actor, he couldn't act his way out of a parking ticket. And I know, I know he had problems with alcohol, and I'm not going to kind of diss him for that. It's a disease, and, and it's horrible if it's not dealt with. So Steve and Dan go in the cave with their flashlights and they start detecting the intermittent radiation and get attacked. Dan gets killed, which is a bit of a shame because Robert Fuller was the better of the double act. His character actually had a little bit of something to him, which Steve sorely lacks. Five days later, Steve comes back and says, oh yeah, Dan went to Las Vegas to get laid. Basically, that's what he's saying. Uh, but Sally and her father, played by an actor called Thomas Brown Henry, which I think is the wrong way around, but that's his name, um, are a bit suspicious. And as soon as Steve gets back, he kisses Sally and starts really impassioning her and starts getting a little handsy, a little bit rapey, because he's been taken over by a giant alien brain who suddenly realises that he's got other organs besides a brain. She fends him off, but the first half of the film, there's a continuing thread of Steve taken over by the alien, whose name is Gore, which is really funny for anybody that's ever read a John Norman novel. And there's a kind of menace about it, which isn't necessarily because John Agar is a good actor, but it's the actions that his character is taking and the way his fiance you know, it's fairly clear that they haven't done the deed yet, fends him off when he gets too passionate and too insistent in that passion. And so that's got a certain edge to have looked at from a modern viewpoint. Gorse decided he's taking over the world because he's an escaped convict from an alien planet and he's got the ability to stare at aeroplanes and make them explode in a blast of nuclear radiation, which he, in the body of Steve, proves. He's got a bit of a limitation there, though, because he has to come out of Steve's body every 24 hours or so to get some oxygen. 
because obviously he can't use Steve's lungs for some reason. And he comes out of Steve's body, and that's when he's vulnerable. Fortunately, there's another alien from the Gore's planet called Vol, who comes to Earth and talks to Sally and her father, and tells them how to deal with Gore, and then occupies the body of Sally's dog, because neither his, Sally nor her father are particularly well suited to the needs of this alien bounty hunter. We get a dog occupied by an alien. We get John Agar occupied by an alien. And the dog's a better actor. Gore in the body of Steve starts making demands. He prematurely blasts a nuclear test on the Nevada testing range and a lot of people get killed. And he goes to the military and tells them he's taking over the world. He wants representatives of every country in the world to come and see him. He's going to take over the industrial base of every country in the world to build a fleet of spaceships so that he can take over his home planet again. He's got ambitions. Now, there's a bit of a problem. He can't be shot because he's got alien super brain powers. Can't be destroyed. And he can just and he can kill people with radiation just by staring at them. Now, this is a low-budget movie. He uses stock footage of nuclear tests. We're giving it a little bit of an Oppenheimer vibe, but not really. Choice Meadows playing Sally is quite good. She really deals with the silliness of the situation and, and the personal peril that she feels when she finds out that her fiancé has been taken over by a horny alien. In fact, this movie should have been called The Brain from Planet Arouse. In fact, it almost is called The Brain from Planet Arouse because the alien finds out he has needs, which makes it very creepy and very funny at the same time. And that aspect of it is probably not necessary for the plot, but they uh, put it in for the driving crowd, I suppose. There's a yeah. I'd like to know the reasons why that that part of it's in there. Maybe to up the ante on the menace and to personalise the menace, rather than just having Gore decide to take over the world and then start showing people that he can blow things up with his eyeballs. But it's um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting addition to the plot of the movie. Now the direction is. is competent but without being great the acting by the other actors apart from john agar is pretty solid and the whole idea of having this weird brain alien which eventually they have to attack with an axe and it's really clear that you can see the bits of fishing line holding the alien brain up in the air which makes it an even better movie from a modern viewpoint it's kind of wild and kind of crazy it's very typical drive-in fodder of the 1950s it doesn't bring a lot new to the game of alien invasion movies, which is something I can't say about Invaders from Mars because I think it does bring some new stuff there. The brain from Planet Aris is mad, but the brain from Planet Aris tries to do like a global threat on a very small scale, which many of these 1950 science fiction drive-in movies did. Kind of grows on you after you've watched it. You look back at it and think, that could have been a really good movie with a better director, a bit more money, and anybody but John Agar in the lead role. And I know I'm going to get comments defending John Agar because they love him, and they saw him when they were seven years old in a drive-in movie when they got a lollipop. But for me, he was the weakest link in this movie. Again, it's worth watching. It's one of those monster kid movies from the day that people like, and I like it too. Particularly when he starts going into megalomaniac mode. It's high school play-level acting for me. I'm going to move on to the better movie, which is 1953's Invaders from Mars, not the 1986 version, I may do that in a future video, but the 1953 version directed by William Cameron Menzies, who directed Things to Come back in 1936, and it's really worth checking out. I should tell you why I picked these two movies as well. We were out heading in towards some thrift stores on the other side of the city, and we stopped at a shopping centre for a personal break. And there was a news agency there which had a whole bunch of DVDs sitting on a display at the front of the news agency. Now, I hadn't seen that for 10 years. There used to be a whole bunch of public domain movies, usually in $2 stores and news agencies back in the day. But I hadn't seen one for a long time, and this one had it. So I'm going through all of the movies, as you do, while I'm waiting for, for sale. And these two turned up for 5 bucks each. I already had copies of them, but I thought I'd get them because I liked the covers. And that's why I'm doing them, because they just serendipitously turned up in a little shopping centre. I don't even know which suburb it was in, but I grabbed them and said to Sal, I'm doing these movies this weekend, I need this for research material. 
And she agreed. In fact, she's going to go mad at me now because I've got two copies of these, but I'm going to give these ones to a charity store. So let's have a look at Invaders from Mars. This one, even though it too has a low budget, really does some interesting things. It's got a lot under the hood. It's about a little boy called David, played by Jimmy Hunt, who's fascinated by astronomy. And he gets up at 4am to see a particular phenomenon that's happening and just happens to see a flying saucer land behind a hill near his house and bury itself in the ground. He tells his father, played by Leif Erikson, who later turned up in high chaparral, amongst other things. And, of course, he's not believed. And his father goes and investigates and comes back a total bastard. He backhands the kid. He talks roughly to his wife, played by Helena Carter, who was a beautiful woman. I've got a little thing for Helena Carter in this movie. And David notices that his father's got a little cross-shaped mark in the back of his neck. Where, as we find out, the aliens have implanted a crystal which lets them control his brain. Inevitably, the mother also gets one of those. The invasion begins. This poor kid has to convince somebody that things are going wrong and there's an alien invasion on the hill behind his house. And that makes the movie really interesting because he goes to a couple of coppers. The coppers get taken over by the aliens when they investigate. And so he then goes and tries to talk to the police chief. The police chief has been taken over as well so the death sergeant makes an executive decision and decides to get a female psychologist or psychiatrist to come and see what this distressed little boy is actually on about she finds out that the kid's not lying because she believes him she sees some really unusual behavior when the parents come to pick him up from the cop shop and then she tells the parents no you can't take him away he's got the symptoms of polio and so we go to take him to the hospital and put him in isolation. Now, polio was the big fear in the early 1950s before the Sabin salt vaccines. So the public health rules on that overruled the rights of parents, which is something we can learn from in modern times. So we get an escalation, not only of the menace and the threat of these aliens who have this really groovy sand whirlpool, which leads to their underground lair, which is done really nicely. It's, it's a good way of, of showing an alien technology on a low budget. I really like the effects they have there. And there are also some other things which escalate the menace nicely. The way the sets of the police station and other places, including a hospital, are made, they're elongated and tall. So you stay in the viewpoint of this little boy. So all the sets are big and out of proportion because... That first half of the movie, at least, is seen from the point of view, even though it's not first person, but it's from the point of view of a little kid. And so that sense of how big external institutions are to this kid is emphasized by the production design. Top marks for that. Then we get a military leader, a colonel, played by Morris Ankrum, who was always good value in those kind of roles. Eventually, they mount an assault on the alien base and do some interesting strategic stuff because the aliens are digging tunnels with a really groovy gun they have. And when the soldiers invade one part of their base, it's sealed off from the other parts and they keep ahead of the soldiers, digging new tunnels and blocking off the old ones. And I kind of like that. I think that's a nice piece of work in this movie. The aliens themselves are interesting. You've got the tentacled alien head in a fishbowl. Other aliens who are quite clearly wearing jumpsuits and Italian sunglasses. But the movie's built up such good will with us. By the time we see the aliens in their jumpsuits and hoods and their funny glasses. And the fishbowl alien is kind of cool and never actually speaks but looks at things like that um, that works for me because because the movie up to then has done things really well and you go yeah well maybe they didn't have the money to do the owners any better than this or maybe that part's not important because we're so invested in the plot of this kid getting his parents back for a start and the human race not being taken over by a bunch of aliens with brain crystals so it works well from that point of view i think the 1986 version is interesting as well but the i always go back to original sources where i can and the 1953 invaders from mars does really well for an alien invasion movie which i think has to be designed for kids because of that point of view character we have and it also has a bit of subtext to it as well you could see the aliens as being a metaphor for the communist menace as it was seen by America at the time, particularly on the antagonism between the military and the aliens. 
and the aliens taking over and brainwashing people, which was the great fear in the Korean War era. After there were some American soldiers in the Korean War who did go over to the communist side through coercion and did some propaganda for the communists and, and particularly the Chinese communists, which was a real shock to the American public at the time. So brainwashing was very much in the zeitgeist at the time this film came out. It's a good film. Uh, I like it. I like the production design, particularly the design of the hill, which is a stage set where the aliens have settled. Then Jimmy Hunt does a pretty good job. He, he, there are a lot of annoying kids in 1950s cinema, but Jimmy Hunt plays it totally straight and plays it really plausibly without any of the annoying tropes and traits that so many child actors had in this kind of movie at the time. And the production design, by the way, was also by the director, William Cameron Menzies. So when he was hired for this gig, he was a twofer. And that look and the kind of bubbly cave look that we get with bubbles of rock on the walls of the caves in some places and the way that the alien's tunneling machine works were done incredibly well and they were done smartly rather than with a lot of expense. And uh, that always delights me when I see it in films. When people try something lateral, like the like the sand whirlpools that people get trapped in when they're caught by the aliens, all of that stuff is dead simple to do if you think it through. And William Cameron Menzies did a top job on that. So these two movies were fun to rewatch. I don't know whether I'm going to rewatch The Break from Planet Aris again, but I might give Invaders from Mars a go sometime in a year or two, and maybe watch it with the 1986 version as well which from what I recall is weird and, and not for me as good as this one. It's just a really interesting film and it's got that magic of being a good film for kids and not being a bad film for grown-ups as well. So that's it for this time around. These were fun. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and leave a comment. You can also support the channel in a couple of ways. First off, there are channel memberships available now on YouTube and you can support the channel by becoming a member and you get some special badges to put up when you make a comment and you also get access to my monthly Spotify playlist which I'm theming now I'm going to be doing like western songs I'm going to be doing spy songs I'm going to be doing classic film songs I'm going to be doing science fiction film songs as well and horror so each month I put out a new Spotify playlist for people to listen to you can also support the channel through Patreon at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies and you get the Spotify playlist and any extra things I do as well. Until next time, when I'm doing the letters M and N on my alphabetical hidden gems of cinema list. So until then, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies, watch some $5 movies, even though these aren't the best copies of these films. And I'll catch you next time.